Okay. So who knows uh, where this is from? So this is a very important set of uh, films for uh, anyone doing physics. I give you an example from my personal life. Um, I was asked once at a job interview what my favorite uh, Monty Python's joke was, my favorite scene was. And uh, you know, I had an answer ready. It kind of satisfied the, the guy I was uh, interviewing with. And uh, in the end, I didn't get a job for other reasons. But uh, this demonstrates you that Monty Pythons are very important if you want to stay in academia. If you want to go uh, to industry or finance, uh, probably not so much. Uh, but uh, I put this picture up uh, for uh, the text. This is a recurring joke in that uh, Monty Python's uh, show. Uh, we are going to talk about something uh, not completely, but very different from the previous uh, 10 lectures. We are going to talk about superconducting devices. Um, and uh, we will spend a few lectures on that. Uh, the first one will be on the basics of superconductivity and uh, on the most basic devices you can imagine. And it will bring us all on the same page in terms of superconductivity, which is on its own a topic that deserves a separate class, maybe even a two-semester class. I had probably four semesters in my life over my entire studies of just superconductivity. It's a fascinating field. It's one of the most beautiful uh, examples in condensed matter physics, which also has implications for things from neutron stars to cold atoms. Everything is uh, uh, in superconductivity. Um, Today we will just um, touch the basics. Um, the literature I gave you at the beginning of the course mostly deals with semiconductors and uh, devices. So I give you um, this book, um, Introduction to Superconductivity by Michael Tinkham. Um, it uh, talks about the foundation. It's been written a while ago, so it does not include all the um, recent quantum transport developments, but it is written by an experimentalist. Uh, so in the spirit of the course, this is one of the good books. But uh, there are many other books that talk about the same stuff. Um, the stuff that we're going to talk about in this lecture is also summarized literally on one or two pages at the end of this quantum transport book, which I did recommend to you, uh, under the Survival Kit for Superconductivity appendix. Uh, this is also what this lecture is going to be. It's a kind of a survivor's kit, a minimum information that I hope will be enough to carry you through understanding wonderful uh, quantum phenomena like flux qubits and uh, Cooper pair splitters and um, Majorana fermions as well. The superconductivity is a story that goes back over a hundred years. Two years ago, uh, uh, centennial of the discovery was celebrated. Um, this uh, guys in, uh, in Leiden, Kammerling Onus and company, uh, they um, were the cryogenic pioneers. They um, were the first to liquefy helium by a fancy set of uh, glass uh, beakers and pumps. They liquefied about this, mu this much of, of helium. It was a challenge that took him 30 years, his pretty much entire career. Um, and then uh, once they had this liquid helium, they started sticking things into it and measuring stuff. And uh, like I said, what is the most basic measurement you can do? This is what we've been discussing for 10 lectures. You know, try to send the current through something. So they send the current through uh, mercury. They put mer mercury in liquid helium, 4 Kelvin. And they send a current, and what they saw was that mercury had absolutely no resistance. Zero. Zero resistance. And uh, this was then confirmed in many other experiments and many other materials. The uh, primary characteristic, why we call it superconductivity, is that uh, there is absolutely no electrical resistance. So that's quite remarkable. 
Um, but it is not just a perfect conductor, so a metal with zero resistance. Um, it is um, a very special quantum mechanical state of matter. Uh, and uh, one of the evidence for that is that uh, in addition to zero resistance, it also exhibits a perfect diomagnetism. So if uh, you put a piece of superconductor in magnetic field, it will generate a screening current, and the field inside the superconductor will be zero. It will be expelled. You can see the, the Meissner effect in this demonstration, a piece of superconductor floating over a magnet. So a magnet creates fields, and those fields are expelled. And um, in total, they create a force that keeps uh, the, the magnet floating. So you can build levitating trains and whatnot um, out of superconductors. OK, so those two basic uh, observations told people that this is a, a special uh, state of matter. Today we will discuss um, these two effects. And the next lecture will be dedicated to this one. Um, and uh, we want to uh, study these effects because uh, in the field of quantum transport, we often want to combine a superconductor uh, for its bizarre properties, uh, like, uh, like these and others that we will discuss, with uh, another material, like a semiconductor that we were uh, spending a lot of time on, where we have the gate tunability and uh, ballistic transport and all these wonderful things that allow us to build uh, interesting devices, um, we can, if we can combine it with superconductors, we get even more interesting devices. So then we study proximity between a superconductor and uh, normal metal. Normal metal is a nickname for anything that's not a superconductor but, but does conduct. So a semiconductor in this context would also be a normal metal, as long as the Fermi level is in the conduction band somewhere or there are some charge carriers around. So it turns out that superconductivity can kind of leak into the normal metal if you put the two close over a coherence length. And we will study a superconductor normal metal interface. The superconductivity is a, is a distinct state of matter, and therefore it's separated from uh, other states of the same matter by a phase transition, a superconducting phase transition. So below a certain temperature, it superconducts. Or below a certain critical field, it superconducts. So um, the very important concept to understand is that superconductivity is finite, constrained within the phase boundaries of uh, in your parameter space. There is a critical magnetic field above which superconductivity does not uh, exist anymore. A critical field HC. There is a critical temperature TC, HC, TC. There is a critical current JC, critical current density. Um, and um, in most superconductors, all of those are connected uh, one of the simplest formulas to connect them is, for example, to connect the critical field to temperature is by this uh, quadratic formula, which is plotted here. Uh, this formula does not come out of anything. It's empiric. There's still no theory that would produce this dependence all the way from around Tc to zero. Uh, this al already tells you that uh, it's a very complex and rich field. Luckily, like I said, it can be reduced to a few concepts that if we understand those concepts, we can go a long way. Not all the way, but a long way. So um, why are all these connected? Why is TC connected to HC? Why, are they, why do they depend on each other? Well, because uh, it's a thermodynamic phase. So there is a certain energy associated with, uh, with that phase. And you can uh, make that phase unfavorable by either uh, adding temperature to the system or by adding a magnetic field through orbital effects or through Zeeman effects. 
and uh, so you can you can kind of kill the phase in both ways so you can kill part of the phase with field and then part of the phase with temperature and you will end up with a phase boundary here it is a phase transition you can see it from um, uh, various uh, thermodynamic properties you calculate like um, usual thermodynamics uh, heat capacity and so on uh, magnetization here is one uh, parameter plotted uh, as you go from <coughs> zero temperature to TC, this length diverges. This length is a penetration depth of magnetic field into the superconductor, London penetration depth. Um, so at TC, this property diverges. This also tells you it's a phase transition. Uh, this property means that um, when you kill superconductivity, magnetic field starts to penetrate through. Uh, so the penetration depth is infinite. Uh, magnetic field doesn't care anymore about the superconductor. But as you go in uh, colder, uh, magnetic field is expelled, but it still penetrates at some finite length, which is small compared to uh, you know, macroscopic sample sizes. So this is the message. It's a finite phase with critical field temperature, critical current density. Now the mechanism, what creates superconductivity? Um, well, by now we know of uh, maybe several mechanisms, but most materials, if you don't go too exotic, are described by the same theory, bardeen cooper schrieffer theory of superconductivity. And uh, bardeen cooper schrieffer theory is all about taking two electrons inside the metal and even though they are negatively charged, so they should repel each other, uh, introduce some attractive interaction between them. In principle, you can just write it in a formula. Let's suppose these two electrons attract. Uh, in practice, uh, in most materials, this attractive interaction comes from phonon exchange. So one electron is flying, and then it emits a phonon, changes direction, and another one's flying this way, and it absorbs the phonon and changes uh, its own direction this way. And so this process of exchanging a phonon created a correlated state between two electrons which were otherwise flying independently. So you need uh, a sufficiently strong electron-phonon interaction to, uh, for a material to be superconducting. And that was a verification of this idea of Bardeen Cooper and Schrieffer. Uh, these guys are called Cooper pairs. And uh, they are bound states of two electrons. But they are not bound states like in a molecule where the two guys are flying together all the time, like an, like an oxygen molecule, for example. They are uh, bound states, but weakly bound. They, both electrons, if you follow them, they kind of fly randomly. But if you count all the correlations between all the electrons in the material, you will see that there are correlations. Uh, so as if this guy formed a Cooper pair with this guy, but then a few seconds later it formed a Cooper pair with another guy. So it's kind of a, these bound states are constantly changing and evolving. So it's a very complex process if you try to think about it. But don't think about it, just think of two coupled electrons. Okay? I ask you not to think too hard. So when I was a, a graduate student uh, uh, in Urbana, uh, Leon Cooper came by. Uh, he was a postdoc in Urbana when he uh, came up with this idea. He came by, uh, I don't know, 40 years later. Uh, he is now doing uh, memory research, medical, where he also is an author of a famous theory, BCM theory, where C also stands for Cooper, but uh, B and M don't stand for Bardeen and uh, I don't know, Meisner, some, some other important people. So he is a brilliant guy. And uh, <laughs> I printed this <laughs> on a slide, and I asked him to leave me an autograph. So, <laughs> so he wrote his autograph, and he also wrote nice work. <laughs> so I think he is still proud of this, of this work, and he should be. So it was a wonderful idea, very counterintuitive, because from the discovery of superconductivity, to this bardeen cooper schrieffer theory that finally explained this state, 50 years passed. And all the brilliant minds, 
of our century, of the last century, Feynman and Landau and many other people were trying to crack this problem. So this was a, a brilliant insight. Now, phase, phases in thermodynamics are described by order parameters. Right? So you go through a phase transition. On the one side of a phase transition, order parameter is 0. And on the other side of the phase transition, order parameter turns on. In this case, order parameter is just the wave function of these Cooper pairs. So what happens is below a certain temperature, these bound states, you see what happened is that from one electron, which is a fermion, we went to bound states, which are bosons. So below a certain temperature, these bound states condense, undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. And they all occupy the same quantum state. So all of them can be described by the same wave function, which is then also serving a double purpose as an order parameter for the superconducting phase. So microscopic uh, processes, uh, Cooper pairing, Bose-Einstein condensation, are connected in this case to thermodynamics of this phase. <coughs> and this phase is characterized by macroscopic phase coherence. So the thermodynamic phase uh, is related to a quantum phase. So if you have a piece of superconductor, no matter how large, you can just think about one wave function occupying the entire piece. This piece can be a ton of superconductor, or it can be a little grain. Always, all the Cooper pairs will be in the same ground state and uh, you just need to know the density of Cooper pairs. And uh, in the entire piece of superconductor, there will be a single phase. So only two parameters are needed to describe this many-body, highly correlated, complex state. So this is the second message. Think about big wave function, which can stretch, in principle, meters or kilometers. There is no limit. It's macroscopic. It has one amplitude everywhere and one phase everywhere. Now, we turn on magnetic field. We can play with that phase. Uh, but if it's just one piece of superconductor in zero magnetic field, you need to know only two numbers to describe this entire piece of superconductor. It's one wave function. So here we make a connection to what we uh, knew about electrons uh, in, the, in the metal, right? We, I asked you to think about them as wave functions that are wave packets flying around and they have a phase uh, and they have an amplitude. Same thing here, except no constraints on the size. Yeah. Macroscopic quantum coherence. So all these Cooper pairs fuel each other to maintain the same phase. This slide is um, meant to help you um, deal with uh, various um, uh, particles that you will encounter when you study superconductivity. Uh, I, uh, I made this slide for this lecture, and I don't know how it's going to go, but I'll try to go through this, and uh, I hope it will be helpful. And if it's not, tell me. Uh, but um, it, it does address a, a common confusion that everybody who starts to study superconductivity has, especially between these, these last ones. And I call it evolution, uh, even though it's not strictly that you start from that and you get here. Uh, it's an evolution in how counterintuitive and complex the concept of this particle becomes as you go from left to right. So in that sense, uh, we are, um, we're going to go through some intellectual evolution. Yeah. So we're going to get to superconductivity. But first, we have to start with, with what uh, happens before <coughs> we turn on all these interactions. If we just have uh, a bunch of electrons in a, in a solid, they are fermions. So uh, in at zero temperature, they will just form this state in momentum space. 
uh, that all the states up to Fermi momentum will be occupied, and all the states above will be empty. That's the Fermi gas, and this will be the Fermi surface in a Fermi gas, right? Now, it turns out you can go from this concept uh, gradually, continuously, to a concept of a Fermi liquid. So Fermi gas is uh, all the particles non-interacting. But you can say, OK, let them interact a little bit. And it will still be described like that, except the electrons will no longer be electrons. They will be quasi-particles. They will be dressed by interactions. But we can still write this approximate theory, the Fermi liquid theory, right? This one is called a quasi-particle. Quasi-particles are defined with respect to Fermi level, the Fermi momentum. And uh, it's, a, it's the elementary excitation above the ground state of a Fermi liquid or a Fermi gas. You have to take one electron from under the Fermi uh, sphere and bring it above. So this electron lives behind this empty space. And this empty space is called a hole. So this is where one of the common confusions comes when we study superconductors, is that this hole is defined with respect to the Fermi level. It's not a hole in a semiconductor. Hole in a semiconductor is in a completely different band compared to the electron, right? If we talk about semiconductors, we talk about conduction bands and valence bands. Um, and uh, this hole is separated from the electron by huge voltages, maybe an electron volt. Here, it can be microvolts, anything. So this is a, a quasi-hole, quasi-electron. And this is a quasi-particle excitation. So you can write the ground state like that as zero, as vacuum, as if all these electrons don't exist. And then write this, these two guys as a next level quasi-particle. Now we go to this one, Cooper pairs. I told you that they are uh, connected states of two electrons. Well. In uh, the BCS theory, in the most basic uh, uh, situation, which is characteristic of most materials by far, there is a special connection between the two electrons in a Cooper pair. First of all, they have to have opposite momentum. So the center of mass of a Cooper pair is not moving. On average, Cooper pairs are just sitting there in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Second. They form a spin singlet. So the two spins of the electrons are opposite. So there are two properties that the Cooper pairs have. Spin singlet and opposite momentum. This is described here. This equation is the ground state of a superconductor according to the BCS theory. It's a product of these kind of guys. And here you can see creation operators for two particles with opposite momentum and opposite spin acting on this phi naught, which is the vacuum, nothing. And they have these UKs and VKs. Interesting, UK actually has nothing in front of it, no creation or no annihilation operators. So if you just had UKs, you would just get vacuum. And uh, these term in the parenthesis, this is kind of like one Cooper pair. And so actually, it is a superposition of nothing and two particles. So that is kind of strange. But what I want to um, tell you with this formula is that um, because it's a Bose-Einstein condensate, the number of particles in this Bose condensate is not conserved. Uh, so you can have as many bosons as you like in the same state, right? Therefore, the number of Cooper pairs is not a good number. You cannot count them up. Uh, next time you count, there could be a different number. And the state will be exactly the same, the same wave function. And this is kind of expressed in this uh, idea, notion that uh, it's a product of nothing and two particles. So you can easily measure it and get nothing for this one and something for the next one.
so in a ground state, um, all this Fermi gas is coupled into pairs of opposite uh, momentum. Now, this last one is, I think, it's the hardest. And uh, it is the hardest because uh, of the nomenclature, the naming. Uh, this is a quasi-particle, and this is a quasi-particle. So that confuses people. So you, you have to distinguish this very simple quasi-particle from this quasi-particle, which is a Bogolubov quasi-particle. Bogolubov quasi-particle is an elementary excitation above a superconducting state, whereas this quasi-particle is an excitation above non-interacting Fermi gas, or a Fermi liquid, which can be rewritten in a non-interacting form. A Bogolubov quasi-particle is different. You can see that it contains creation and annihilation so it contains hole and electron in one particle. Actually, you can get in a linear fashion from these operators, the Bogolubov operators, to Fermi liquid operators, which are Cs. And it's a linear transformation. But notice that these UKs and VKs are the same UKs and VKs as here. So these are coherence factors that come from the superconducting pairing, from superconducting correlation. So Bogolubov wrote this transformation, and uh, there is a direct connection between these coefficients to the BCS theory. So an elementary excitation above the superconducting state is uh, not a simple quasi-particle. It is a superposition of an electron and a hole with opposite momenta an opposite spin. You can also say that the Cooper pair is two Bogolubov quasi-particles. So, is it confusing? No, it's not. Great. I'm happy. The next, uh, the next very important notion about superconductors is that uh, they have a gap. Again, don't confuse with semiconducting gap, which is a gap between the bands. Superconducting gap is a little gap around the Fermi surface. Think about it this way. Um, all the Cooper pairs have condensed into a condensate. What protects this state? is the fact that the excited state above the condensate is some finite energy above the condensate level. That's why there is a gap. So this gap is created by interactions between electrons that form Cooper pairs. And uh, so to break a Cooper pair costs you energy, and that energy is a superconducting gap. So the superconducting gap is uh, of order 100 microvolts, maybe a millivolt, 2 millivolts in conventional superconductors. So the critical temperature for that energy scale would be 1 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin, and so on. Yeah? It's 100 microvolts per Kelvin. But we can use our intuition that we have from semiconductors to think about superconductors. We can think about superconductors this way. Here's a Fermi level in a superconductor. And what I plot here is the density of states, but of single particle states, not of Cooper pairs. So all the Cooper pairs are condensed here at zero energy, at the chemical potential. And single particle excitations, broken Cooper pairs, are not allowed within the gap from where the condensate sits, where the Cooper pairs sit. So above the gap, you have these single particle density of states. And uh, below the gap, you have the single particle density of states. And these are Bogolubov quasi-particles. And one characteristic feature that comes out from calculations is that 
at the gap, the density of states has this peak. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, van Hove singularities that we dealt with in one-dimensional systems, right? Uh, there's some kind of diver divergency at the, at the point. Uh, but it uh, has nothing to do with one-dimensionality. Uh, this will happen in a 3D superconductor as well. So it's just uh, visually similar. You can think about uh, these peaks, which are sometimes called uh, quasi-particle peaks or um, BCS peaks, as uh, states that were displaced from here, they just shifted over and they kind of piled on outside. This is kind of how I feel, think about these states. <coughs> and on the left, you see uh, a normal metal by comparison. Uh, you can have a Fermi level, and everything below the Fermi level is occupied. You can move the Fermi level around by, for example, a gate or a bias. Um, and it will just continuously shift. If you shift this guy around, there will be these gaps that you will drag with you. So the next thing you can do is you can say, okay, let's build a device, right? We are studying devices. Uh, let's build a device where normal metal is in contact with a superconductor, but there is a tunneling barrier, maybe an insulator. So NIS device. Uh, well, then we have uh, these kind of densities of states. And we can ask ourselves, what will be the current flowing through this structure? Um, well, the answer is that um, so long as uh, this chemical potential is inside the gap, these electrons, which are single particles, are not allowed to flow here. So the current will be zero. And uh, when you exceed the gap, apply EV larger than delta, electrons will have states available on the other side to go, and there will be current. And remember that current is, an in, is an proportional to the product of the densities of states. So in 3D metal it's a constant, and here it will have this peak, so just as we reach the, the gap edge, there will be a spike. And then it will go to some finite uh, constant level. Now what if we have two superconductors? S-I-S tunneling junction. As a similar logic, uh, all the states uh, below the Fermi level are occupied, except there is also a gap on the other side. So uh, you will not expect a current here until you exceed EV equal 2 times delta, or delta 1 plus delta 2. So here is just EV equal delta. We'll start the current. Here, EV equal delta 1 plus delta 2. If the two superconductors are the same, delta. And if we have uh, a finite temperature, uh, at finite temperature, there might be some quasi-particle occupation here, and therefore, and some empty states here, therefore there will be some current even below the gap. That's the, this is how you can apply logic from semiconductors to superconductors. So these are um, calculated current voltage characteristics for this system, NIS. Uh, at zero temperature in the IV, uh, you will have nothing until you reach the gap, and then current will increase. At finite temperature, there will be some current already below the gap. Notice that this uh, dependence has to extrapolate to zero. Right, so if we take a derivative of this, uh, is plotted here. So the density of states um, shows up in conductance, not in uh, IV, but in DI dV. When we uh, take a DI dV, we get the density of states directly. So at uh, zero temperature, well, times the occupation. Density of states times occupation. So at zero temperature, we will recover this dependence. And at finite temperature, we'll have some states uh, filling even within the gap.
Now to relate to what we were studying before, um, a similar device, superconductor, superconductor, but in between uh, we stick a quantum dot. So we have not an insulating barrier and direct coupling between the two, but a, a, a sequence of discrete chemical potentials, quantum levels in a quantum dot. Then, uh, okay, in quantum dots we have these Coulomb diamonds as we sweep the gate and bias, right? And uh, these correspond to uh, aligning uh, quantum levels in a dot one by one uh, with a chemical potential uh, window uh, between source and drain. So here a quantum level is aligned, here a quantum level is aligned. But now let's look at, uh, at the bias. What we see is there are these two lines at constant voltage. That's the superconducting gap. So it can show up in a quantum dot measurement uh, as two lines for minus delta and plus delta for negative bias and positive bias. This example is from a carbon nanotube. You, you can get the same data with uh, many other quantum dots. Um, here are a couple of line cuts. Um, these are the GS and uh, ES, those are the quantum levels in, uh, in a quantum dot, like we discussed before. But these QP um, peaks are the quasi-particle peaks, uh, which are anomalies in the density of states of the lead. So the difference is that before, uh, we only studied quantum dots where the density of states in the source and the drain was just a constant. Now we can see the anomalies in the density of states of the leads in the quantum dot because there is much more current flowing when you line up these anomalies together. So this will be a two delta position. So for aluminum, delta is about 100 microvolts. You expect these at 200 microvolts. There is also a very elegant way to uh, see that Cooper pairs have charge 2, also based on Coulomb blockade. Uh, beautiful experiments. Uh, we have to remember the concept of addition energy. So this, uh, this data will be, I'll show you what it is. Uh, it is taken on a, a small island of a superconductor. I, mean, I, I think it's aluminum. And that island has about a billion electrons. So remember, in a quantum dot with billion electrons, all the Coulomb diamonds should be the same size. Because uh, quantum energy for so many electrons is so small. Um, its uh, density of levels is so high that uh, the only thing you have to pay to add each electron is the charging energy. So you expect this kind of very regular pattern of Coulomb diamonds. This is what you get when you have many electrons. But this island of aluminum was superconducting. And so there was a difference between adding one electron to make um, the total number even or to make it odd. So imag imagine you have a billion electrons, and the system still cares whether it's a billion plus one or a billion plus two, or a billion plus three, a billion plus four, etc. Um, this is why, um, so because uh, the wave function on the island is a condensate of Cooper pairs, it prefers to have an even number of charges, even number of electrons. So it can have all of them paired up in pairs. If you add just one above, you have to find an energy equal to the superconducting gap. So about 100 microvolts for uh, aluminum. And so uh, the addition energy, which is just the electrostatic energy, would also have this superconducting term, which would be zero for even and one for odd, one gap. And the uh, energies will go like that. Ground state, one extra electron. Ground state, one extra electron. So the system does not care if you have zero, two, four, six electrons, but it does care if you have one electron. 
So that translates into how much energy you have to give with your gate to add an electron. Here are the curves from this uh, wonderful experiment. Um, in the normal state of the same system, they just heat it up a bit or apply a magnetic field to exceed the superconducting field, critical field. Uh, you get a regular staircase of charge occupation in this dot as you sweep the gate. And then they cool this thing down and they see this even odd effect. So a small step, a large step, a small step, a large step. So every other electron costs you energy to add, uh, add it to the system. Even odd effect is uh, one of the simplest ways to see that Cooper pairs have a charge too. This is a, sort of extending that concept further uh, into the realm of quantum information. Uh, one of the first Rabi oscillations in a solid state was obtained with Cooper pairs. Last lecture I told you about charge qubits, superpositions of zero and one charges in a semiconductor quantum dot. On this experiment, a group in Japan has made a, a superconducting device and in this island, uh, separated by tunneling junctions, is also aluminum. And uh, so it is uh, called sometimes a Cooper pair box. It's a little box where you can put Cooper pairs. Uh, it's a, you could also call it a superconducting quantum dot. But uh, this is kind of a historic, historic name, Cooper pair box. And uh, they have observed coherent oscillations, but now between the states of zero charge and two charge. Yeah. So I don't want to explain this experiment completely. Uh, I just wanted to make you aware of it uh, that uh, we will spend actually a whole lecture on superconducting qubits in, in a couple of uh, lectures. So this is just kind of a preview for that. Now is the moment to summarize uh, these basic facts that you need to know about superconductivity to, uh, for this course to, to move forward. So once again, <coughs> you can make negatively charged electrons attract, for example, via electron phonon interaction, which will make them form Cooper pairs. Uh, Cooper pairs are bound states of electron with a spin singlet and opposite momentum. So on average, Cooper pairs don't move. They both uh, condense into the ground state, which is then characterized by a wave function in the entire piece of superconductor, just one amplitude, which is the density of Cooper pairs. So it turns out to be density of states at the Fermi level in a normal system. And one value, just one number of of phase. One complex number describes the entire superconductor. And um, there is an energy gap associated with the Bose-Einstein condensation. This is like the energy you have to pay to break a Cooper pair. So in the density of states of single particles, there will be these anomalies, which are the BCS ears. And the energy gap gives you a critical temperature, critical field. You just need to convert from energy to temperature and so on. There are certain factors that come out of theories that are not exact. Uh, all these theories are approximate because the, the state is very complex. There is no 100% uh, accurate theory. OK? All right. The second part of the lecture is about um, and sort of um, application of superconductivity uh, that is important for real devices. Proximity effect. This is how to think about it. Here's an interface between a superconductor and a non-superconductor, a normal metal. 
Here you have all these Cooper pairs, right? Uh, they are highly correlated state of electrons. Spin singlets, opposite momentum. Uh, they are also phase locked, right? Because they're all in the wave function with the same phase. So this is a microscopic phase coherent state. Um, now let's uh, make this boundary very, very clean and easy to cross. So electron can just fly here and before he knows, he finds himself outside in a normal metal. So what happens? Well, there is no uh, conditions for superconductivity. There is no electron phonon interaction strong enough to keep the correlations. Um, so it will um, not be a Cooper pair anymore. Except it will maintain this phase coherence for some time, for the dephasing time. So it's like a real electron, like we discussed for the rest of the course. It, it comes out with a certain spin, a certain phase, a certain momentum. And it will be some time before he loses all that information. So that means that a certain, in practice, a certain distance away from the boundary, there will be these correlations. And if you sum them all up, you can still get the order parameter, just like in a superconductor. So the superconducting wave function decays into the normal metal. It's like an evanescent state for a wave. And the wave can penetrate into the tunneling, into the tunneling regime and have an evanescent tail. And that tail has a length which is the coherence length of electrons in a normal metal. The same coherence length from the lectures before uh, just the length over which electron loses its phase information. And then two electrons in a Cooper pair forget each other, become uncorrelated. There is also an inverse proximity effect. We will not study it much, but you have to realize that uh, it also means that normal electrons can fly a little bit into the superconductor and uh, decrease the density of uh, electrons here. So at the interface, there will be some transition. So many interesting effects are um, related to this proximity effect. And proximity effect is observed in many different systems. Already many of them we mentioned in this course. Uh, carbon systems, nanowires, uh, certain semiconductors, but not all. In particular, this uh, prominent example that I always come back to, a gallium arsenide, two-dimensional electron gas, uh, doesn't work. Few reasons. First of all, a two dimensional electron gas is 100 nanometers below the surface. So, Cooper pairs will have to tunnel very far to get to that gallium arsenide. Um, there is also, a, even if you could edge down to the two deck, there is a Schottky barrier. Uh, this is a semiconductor effect. Uh, there's some mismatch in work functions between a metal and a semiconductor. Uh, so, you have to pay a lot of energy to go into the um, semiconductor from a metal and superconductor the same and uh, then you break Cooper pairs. There are also other technical details. Uh, you have to use nickel in this process and uh, gold and those are all non-superconducting materials. So you have to travel about a hundred nanometers through a non-superconductor and then go over a Schottky barrier so uh, that's hopeless. But on the other hand indium arsenide has no Schottky barrier. And so uh, Cooper pairs just go in with some loss, but very easily. You can even couple um, superconductors to ferromagnets. That is very interesting because in ferromagnets, uh, all spins want to align in the same direction. So a Cooper pair that comes in as a singlet has to go into something which is a, prefers triplets. So there is some interesting interplay here. We will not discuss it in this course. There is a very um, um, simple, yet not the most intuitive, um, idea that helps you understand the transfer between normal metal and Cooper pairs. It's called Andreev reflection. I will take a couple of slides to introduce it. So once again, um, 
the two graphs show the difference in the density of single particle states, not the Cooper pairs, but single electrons in a normal metal and a superconductor. In a normal metal, this is the Fermi level, and we define all the excitations below as holes and all the excitations above as electrons. And they go just w straight down to the Fermi level, so there is no anomaly. So there are always quite single particle states. In a superconductor, there is this gap. So if you are at the energies around the gap, you cannot be a single particle. So it's very easy to go from here to here if you apply a voltage difference which is larger than this gap. So at this energy you can just go. There are single particle states available and uh, at the low bias you cannot go as a single, as a single particle. So you can do a trick. The trick is called Andreev reflection. Here's how it goes. You come as a, in as an electron. You make a Cooper pair. But a Cooper pair needs two charges. So where does the second charge come from? Well, it comes from the same electron because you send back into the normal metal a hole. So in that process, we came in with an electron, we left with a hole, and uh, that process um, means that the normal metal lost a charge of two. And in that time, into the superconductor, we transferred also a charge of two, a Cooper pair. So this is in contrast with a normal reflection, which is uh, just like bouncing off the wall with a ball. Electron goes in, electron goes out, and uh, reflects off the boundary. So one visual difference you can see here is that the hole reflects the same direction. It's because uh, holes kind of have a, um, you, know, you have to have momentum conservation for this process to work. These Cooper pairs uh, have zero momentum. So this thing works, indeed. Uh, you can uh, go inside the superconductor via this Andreev channel. Let's see if there is some Interesting text here. Okay, so in a little bit more detail, how it works, um, you have to keep in mind these energies. So if you come in with an electron, a quasi particle, which is electron like, um, and you have a certain energy between zero and the gap, the Cooper pair has a zero energy, so it has a Fermi energy. So a hole has to have opposite energy for this Cooper pair to form. So there's this energy constraint. Um, and you can, um, yeah, this is described here. Uh, then uh, there is an almost perfect conservation of momentum. Um, it's not exactly perfect because uh, electron and hole are not exactly symmetric unless they are really at zero. But what I want to draw your attention to is that um, whenever you undergo a reflection like that, uh, maybe you remember from metals, uh, from photons, scattering of metals, for example, you always have to take into account a phase at the boundary. So you might get a phase shift if you come in and reflect. Uh, and that phase shift, uh, well, it depends on your energy, but it also depends on the phase of this condensate. So the terms have phase of the hole, at which reflects, will have the phase of the electron. It will have some term that depends on energy. Those are all intuitive just from reflecting and coming back. But you also have to take into account the phase of the superconductor. So Andrea reflection is sensitive to phase. That's the message. Now, if you just have one piece of superconductor, actually it doesn't matter. Because 
uh, you can always gauge out this phase and say uh, the phase is accurate to within 2, two pi, so we can just uh, make the phase uh, irrelevant. It will be always the same phase in every process, so it doesn't play a role. One slide on the uh, theoretical description of uh, these Andreev processes. Um, there is something called the uh, Bogolub of the Gen equation uh, to describe this uh, coming into the interface uh, of N and S. And uh, it, it looks really like Schrodinger equation. So matching waves and uh, uh, these kind of uh, things. Except uh, it's a little bit modified. There are two sets. And that's because you have to have the electron part and the hole part in this Schrodinger equation, the Bogolub of Degen equation. And um, this is a very elegant form of representing this equation, which strips all the details. Uh, if you need to calculate uh, something based on this equation, you should read the proper superconducting textbook. But for now, just uh, let's just look at these uh, terms. Um, when you're in a normal metal, then the superconducting pairing is zero. So electrons and holes are not connected. And you just have a, a Hamiltonian for a moving particle and the complex conjugate. That's all you have. And in the superconductor, you have these cross correlations between electrons and holes. So those are the bogolub of quasiparticles that have superpositions of electrons and holes in them. So if you want to calculate transport through, a, through an interface, you start with this kind of equation. Now people have done uh, numerous measurements of uh, Andrea reflection. Uh, this is one of the early works um, where they uh, took a tip of uh, copper and they stuck it into a surface of niobium or vice versa. I did not look it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> it could be a piece, a, a tip of niobium that they stuck into copper. Uh, but um, no, I think it has to be copper stuck into niobium. Uh, but basically, um, uh, this this was an early way to make a very clean contact, crash a little tip into a surface, um, and um, they um, did something that's called point contact spectroscopy, where uh, Quasi-particles had a very easy way of going into the superconductor through this tip. And um, this is a very interesting uh, manifestation of Andrea reflection. You have to realize is that uh, because for each electron you get a charge transfer of 2 into the superconductor, the conductance that you expect should be double. So if this were a quantum point contact, for example, not a, this is a classical point contact, but if it were quantum, then instead of 2 e squared over h of conductance, we would get steps of 4 e squared over h. Because every time we go in with an electron, a hole reflects back, and a Cooper pair is transferred. And so for every electron that we send, we get a charge transfer of 2. So if we count the current, we'll get twice as, many, as much current. So the most naive expectation for conductance would be that below the gap, when we have Andreev processes, conductance is double. And then it, at the gap, it goes down by a half. What they measured in an experiment is um, quite different. This is the gap. This is the uh, zero. This is zero voltage. So they don't have a, a steep thing. They have something smooth. So maybe it's uh, some disorder, some finite um, transmission. At the gap, they have a dip. It's not a factor of 2. And after that, it actually goes up a bit. So they did see the gap in this dependence. But they didn't see it very clean. Turns out the same two people plus uh, turn Klapwijk, uh, were able to explain this data very nicely. And uh, the reason I'm showing this graph is 
this uh, transparency is uh, not because it relates to that one experiment, but because this paper by Blonder, Tinkham, and Klapwijk is a very useful tool for calculating uh, transmissions from superconductor to normal metal and vice versa. Uh, very simple, very simple method. They took this Bogolubov de Jean equation, this Schrodinger equation with electrons and holes, and they did a wave matching between the superconductor and the normal metal, like we do wave matching for transmission through tunnel barriers in quantum mechanics one, right? The, the simplest thing. So they just uh, added a little barrier in between a superconductor and a normal metal, described by some z parameter, which is the, how much the wave function drops as it goes through that barrier. So some, some matching of, of waves gives you a z parameter. Uh, and by this, uh, they modeled disorder, some kind of bar barrier left over, some dirt at the interface, all the kinds of real system properties. But even in very clean systems, things like Schottky barriers, mismatches in Fermi velocity in a semiconductor and a superconductor, all of those can be incorporated into that Z. And then so for, for different Zs, uh, they got these different curves. Uh, for z equals zero, perfect transmission, this is what the naive expectation was. But then for other z's, you can have uh, all kinds of things. Like for example, you can have a very low level going into a peak and down. And so they were able to explain their data uh, using this theory. If you are measuring uh, an NS interface, and you want to characterize it, one simple way you can do that is take a, um, a slope at high bias and extrapolate it to zero bias. And if it intercepts zero, there is no Andreev reflection. And if the intercept is above zero, there is this kind of virtual excess current. That excess current is from Andreev processes. So they give you some extra charge transfer above what you expect from Ohm's law. So the IV curve will not extrapolate to zero, but will go above. So the, the, and the, the idea is that um, somewhere inside this transport characteristic, Andreev processes contribute extra charge transfer and uh, give you this excess current. Here's another thing that can happen. <clears throat> now we're talking about a system which has uh, two superconductors. Okay. So before we were talking about NS, uh, NS interface. Now we're talking SNS. Now that, that's a straightforward extension of the same concept. So now we can have an Andreev reflection here and another Andreev reflection here. And we can uh, apply a bias to this system. So the difference with uh, what I discussed in the beginning of the lecture is that now electrons can travel through this layer. They can even travel far. And uh, in the beginning of the lecture, we had a tunnel barrier here. Yeah. So they just had to tunnel across. And now they can fly, scatter, and reach here. That's all allowed. So, of course, if we exceed the bias by 2 delta, we will get some current like before, like in a tunneling regime. Because we will align this density of state anomaly with this density of state anomaly. And the single particle current will just flow. But at smaller biases below the gap, <coughs> we can have this kind of process. We send an electron out at the, at the edge of the density of states. It comes in, but it is uh, not high enough in energy, so it reflects back as a hole. It reflects with a hole which has a, a different energy. You have to mirror it around the Fermi level. So this reflected particle has a higher energy, and it comes here. Oh, and here it is below this Fermi level. So it reflects into the opposite particle, which has an even higher energy. And then, oh, after two of these things, 
we gained enough energy through these reflections to actually escape. So a little bit analogous to Fabry Perot processes in interferometers. Yeah? So every reflection we we get a little bit of energy and um, we can escape. And then of course uh, these multiple Andre reflection processes uh, will have some uh, higher probability when the distance uh, between the, these two anomalies is somehow commensurate with the energy that you gain at this uh, crossing. So here's what I mean. Um, there will be extra current when you can exactly travel once, twice, three times, etc., back and forth between the left and the right. And uh, for each of these, you will need a, you will have a resonance for the energy mismatch, which is equal to 2 delta, delta, 2 thirds, and finally 2 over n. So multiple Andrea reflection will give you little resonances below the gap when you match the bias with the gap, but a fraction of a gap. So here are some calculated curves. Here is the gap. And what you expect is little uh, features below the gap. So you can measure very accurately the gap. You can tell that Cooper pairs get from one side to the other via multiple Andre reflection processes if you have this staircase of uh, little uh, resonances, which are at 1 over n times the gap, 2 delta. I think these are different uh, Z parameters or transmissions or something. Yeah. For, Z, for small Z, it's good transmission, so you have them very clear and then they wash out. Can they uh, form interference patterns? Like a type of well, this is kind of what these are. So Sorry. it's not the exact analogy, but so these dimples correspond exactly to these situations. So you, you, go, you reflect several times, and the reason why you still can transmit a Cooper pair is because you maintain phase coherence over this process. If electrons dephase during this travel, you will not get any features. That's multiple Andrea reflection. We're going to talk about several different kinds of Andrea reflection now. Cross Andrea reflection. Very interesting phenomenon. Um, experiments are done in a non-local geometry. So you have a superconductor. And uh, what, what the idea is that you send a current from a superconductor into a normal conductor. And you want one of the electrons from the Cooper pair to go left and the other one to go right. And there should be some correlation between the two because these electrons came from a correlated state, a Cooper pair, which is a spin singlet and opposite momentum. So if electrons want to go in pairs, there should be some correlation. Several groups have done work in this area. Uh, I just picked a paper from a group in Basel uh, where they used a semiconductor nanowire with two quantum dots here and here, so two gates and two normal contacts, superconductor in between. And what they do is they apply a bias here, small bias, and they measure currents here and here. So they look at correlations. This is the, the idea. Cooper pairs come in, and they go into this dot and that dot. And they are separated by an energy gap, like that. So this is what they get in the normal state. They make that superconductor normal, apply a small field maybe. And um, they sweep a gate on the second dot, on the right dot, gate 2. They get Coulomb peaks. 
in the through the right dot, and they get the inverse in the left dot. So that is easy to understand. Uh, you have more current going to the right, and you have less current going to the left. So at the Coulomb resonances, it's very easy to go to the right, and it becomes a little bit harder to go to the left. So the current just starts to flow here and flowing less here. So this is a normal situation, easy to understand. Superconductor, yeah, very similar green trace, right? Again, you have Coulomb diamonds the same way in the right dot. But now on the left dot, you actually get more signal whenever there is more signal there. So current has an easy time going in both directions. So it used to be that when it's easier to go here, it's harder to go here. Now, when it's easy to go here, it's also easy to go there. So this group interpreted this data as um, evidence that electrons want to go in pairs. And when it's easier for them to go at least one way, they also go the other way. So that is called crossed Andrea reflection. To me, it's kind of a, a little bit indirect this way. Especially um, since this is a very nice field to study, because in principle, these Cooper pairs are in this highly correlated state. They're in a singlet state, which is an entangled state of two electrons. So if you can separate the two, you can imagine doing uh, fancy quantum mechanical e experiments like uh, Bell inequality on Cooper pairs. Uh, because uh, one part of the singlet goes here, the other one goes there, so if you measure this spin, the other one has to be opposite. Right? You can do these kind of experiments. So it's interesting where this field's going to go next. Um, one of the next developments was to uh, you know, look at, try to look at individual Cooper pairs as they go. Um, this is a very powerful technique called noise spectroscopy. And I haven't uh, talked about it before in the course. Uh, but I want to use this opportunity to mention it. And many things that you can learn in quantum transport come from noise. Somebody said that somebody's noise is somebody's data. Uh, this is certainly the case in quantum transport. You can learn a lot from noise. I'm kind of not the expert on that. So I leave it to you to discover on your own. But I give you this one example. And it's very easy to explain for me because here you have a Again, a similar system, superconductor and two normal metals. Uh, so you want to uh, know whether Cooper pairs go in and split like that. So they go from aluminum into two coppers like that, whether they split. Uh, well, that has to induce some correlation in the noise. That's the statement. And the reason is that uh, electrons, they're discrete particles. So uh, when they tunnel from one uh, metal to the other, there is always shot noise associated with the fact that uh, in one time period there will be n electrons going and in the next time period n plus 4. So there is kind of a stochastic tunneling process. But if the electrons are correlated in pairs, then the noise in this current and noise in this current should be correlated. So these people have set up two amplifiers on the left and on the right. And they biased the two junctions, and they looked for correlations. And they found some. So this color plot plots the voltage cross-correlation on the two amplifiers. So they see if, if both amplifiers are a little bit higher noise, it gives you a large signal. If they're opposite, it gives you a negative signal. Um, and they saw that um, when uh, they bias the two junctions in the same direction, there is this uh, positive cross-correlation. Took it as a, another evidence for crossed and drive reflection that electrons go in pairs. Okay, I think uh, we stop here, and next lecture will be about uh, supercurrents flowing from one superconductor to the other through a normal barrier, which is called the Josephson effect.